<clears throat> okay, uh, so uh, today is the 5th of March 2022, and we'll pay homage to Louis Kahn. Uh, <clears throat> let's read a little bit about him. Louis is Ador Khan, but he was born uh, with a different name. You see it written there. Was born on March 5th, but in, uh, in the old uh, uh, way of uh, you know counting time, it was February 20th the old system uh, in 1901 and he died in 1974 <clears throat> was an, an American architect uh, based in Philadelphia after working in various capacities for several firms in Philadelphia he founded his own atelier in 1935 while continuing his private practice he served as a design critic and professor of architecture at Yale School of Architecture from 1947 <clears throat> to 1957. From 1957 until his death, he was a professor of architecture at the School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. Kahn created a style that was monumental and monolithic. His heavy buildings for the most part do not hide their weight, their materials or the way they are assembled famous for his meticulously built works, his provocative proposals that remained unbuilt, and his teaching, Kahn was one of the most influential architects of the 20th century. He was awarded the AIA, that's uh, the American Institute of Architects, of Architects, gold medal and the Riva gold medal. At the time of his death, he was considered by some as America's foremost living architect. Here he is, here he was, um, drawing, drawing um, incessantly, a uh, very special uh, architect uh, who struggled uh, when he was very young uh, with, uh, with poverty. Uh, he came with his parents from Estonia where he was born and they, uh, here he was uh, becoming, uh, maybe not just the foremost American architect, but maybe uh, the foremost uh, world architect at the time when he died. I like Khan, I always did like Khan, even after I found out about his troubles in his personal life, but we shouldn't perhaps uh, judge, uh, you know, uh, or consider I don't know, it's a complex subject. You know, we all have a so-called personal life with, with problems. He had his, and, uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's look at his work. This will be a rather large presentation. I have more than 400 pictures. It will be a very comprehensive review of the works of uh, one of the most important architects of the 20th century. a very intense man, totally dedicated to architecture. And uh, I think he, will, he is and was and will be an example for uh, those who want to study architecture and practice architecture. When he was a, a child, uh, before he left uh, with his parents for the United States, he was the victim of a, of a fire uh, accident which burned his face and apparently his mother said uh, my son will be uh, uh, a, a great person and he became a great person meaning a great architect no doubt here he is with Carlos Scarpa on the right they were friends uh, and uh, Luis can even um, wrote uh, you know, by the by the way of Carlos Carpa's work, uh, the memorable um, phrase that the detail is the adoration of the of the of the joint. <clears throat> by the way of the works by uh, by Carlos Carpa. Here he was drawing with two hands. I think we need heroes, not arrogant heroes, but we need uh, genuine uh, examples of uh, people who. Uh, you know, built their lives in in uh, in a creative way, and and Khan in architecture 
was such a person. Now, Louis Kahn and his women, I don't know if this title is very inspired or inspiring first with his wife, Esther Kahn, uh, on a ship probably uh, going to the States or uh, away from the States, I don't know. Here they are, he looks kind of a little bit uh, cocky, but uh, uh, anyway, <clears throat> this was his, his wife until he died. But apparently he was not uh, always happy with just uh, her. So here he is with Anting, uh, the architect who uh, gave her, gave him uh, a daughter. Uh, and uh, she was employed by Louis Kahn in, in his office. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, they got involved and um, Khan became unofficially a father again. Nobody knew that he had, uh, you know, another child <clears throat> with uh, his young uh, employee, but he did. <clears throat> and uh, this was not enough. <clears throat> he also, uh, you know, entered into a relationship with Harriet Pattison, uh, who gave him a, a son, the very son that made that movie, um, My Architect. <clears throat> So here it was, uh, it is uh, the cover of a book, a memoir with letters from Louis Kahn by Harriet Pattison. Here they are. Um, <laughs> who would have thought, you know, at that time they looked happy, but uh, behind the, the, the apparent happiness, there was something else. And my opinion is that he also died because of those, um, troubles behind the smiles. Sketches, drawings by Louis Kahn. <clears throat> I like his drawings very much. Uh, I don't think we have too many architects these days who, who can draw like this. Certainly not between the stars. I mean, by comparison, I am very sorry, but the drawings of the Archangels, for example, are uh, cartoons. Uh, compared with, uh, with the artistic integrity and quality of the drawings. Even the sketches by Louis Kahn are, show a level of intensity and seriousness and uh, uh, expression that cannot be found easily in, uh, in today's uh, even most uh, famous, uh, in the works of the most famous architects. This is a sketch for the Bryn Mawr um, dormitory. We are going to see the building. I am going to rush a little bit because um, I will have to leave uh, not much later after 7.30, but we'll, 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 we'll go through his work uh, quite thoroughly. This is a sketch for the, um, uh, well, it's a building that uh, Philips, uh, Richard's laboratories in uh, in Philadelphia and uh, um, a seminal building that started his um, international career in a way. He became famous after he built this building. This is a sketch for the Kimball Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, again, uh, a fragment from the, the dormitory in uh, in Bryn Mawr. Um, sketches, I don't know exactly for what building here. Anyway, he drew continuously. There is a book which I actually have with uh, paintings and sketches of Louis Kahn. Uh, so art is a visual art. Uh, architecture is a visual art. And uh, you know, those who deny it, uh, deny the essence of architecture. Uh, it's not a science, I am sorry. It, it has a scientific side, yes, it is connected. You need to know how to build. And it, it has a technical side, but uh, you know, what, what are we looking at here? We are looking at uh, expressive drawings. Um, anyway. He was also what is called today, uh, or maybe not just today, a visionary architect. You know, you look at this sketch and, uh, you know, these are not uh, uh, sketches of, uh, you know, uh, 
low key and dreamer. No, no, they are the other sketches of a dreamer. But he was also a doer, not just a dreamer. And in architecture, of course, you cannot dream without doing and you cannot do without dreaming. That is if you want to deserve your name as an architect. Studies for Philadelphia, they didn't come into being. Uh, Self-portrait. Study trips <clears throat> or trip studies. <clears throat> you could uh, you could say it both ways. Uh, Siena, the pyramids, Luxor, Pestum, I guess, or uh, yes, it must be Pestum, uh, Siena, Imhotep's uh, pyramid, the first step pyramid that uh, Imhotep, the first architect in history, as we think we know it. Uh, that he built for um, Pharaoh Zoser. His, uh, his um, year spent in, uh, I think it was just one year in, in Rome at the, the American Academy in Rome, changed his life, changed his architecture. It was, it was of the, the utmost importance that year he spent uh, in, in Rome. Now we start with very early works, that we, works which are not so well known. Early works, the Mill Creek project in Philadelphia, housing, social housing. At first, he actually became famous around 55. So he came late to architecture. I mean, no, he worked in architecture, but he struggled you know, to get commissions like a man without public relations, without uh, connections. Uh, coming from a rather difficult background. Um, so, you know, Louis Kahn started slowly. His friend Vincent Scully, the important historian and theoretician said that in Kahn's work, there is the meeting between a laser light and uh, the light of a candle. And I like this, the doubleness of these two lights. You have uh, looking forward and you have looking backwards, but it's also the light of affluence and the light of, uh, of uh, well, uh, in a way of poverty. So these are, you know, uh, humble uh, or, or, you know, modest uh, houses, uh, part of a large project that he did with social housing. They still exist, I think. I hope. Maybe there is more I hope than I think. I am. Uh, I forgot if I read that they were destroyed or not. Anyway, that's what he did. One of his very early works, uh, and he didn't do just uh, the individual buildings or row of buildings, but also rows of buildings, but also the urban planning, as you can see. So <clears throat> there is rigor, but there is also playfulness. You see that there is a degree of freedom, uh, you know, the way he placed these towers and uh, there is order, but also, I don't, I wouldn't say disorder, but, um, you know, a certain degree of freedom. Now the Coward Shoes Company in Philadelphia, this is also by Louis Kahn. You see the, the cars that tell you the, the age, the year when, when the building was built, but the building is still resolutely modern. In fact, if this building was built today, just as Khan did it, then it would have been uh, very noticed and published everywhere. Now, a famous work from 1951, the Yale University Art Gallery, uh, with its famous ceiling and roofing, here is the younger, Louis Kahn looking upwards to it, uh, uh, work of, of uh, integrity and, and rigor, but also sensitivity. The ceiling is very important. Uh, and uh, I hope I have an image also from the top. Uh, stair uh, with three sides, uh, which is, uh, you know, based on the triangle and uh, itself, uh, you know, event, an eventful, um, an eventful uh, architecture. 
So it was designed in 1953, the Yale University Art Gallery. He did another work um, uh, for the British Art Museum at Yale. We are going to see too. Look at the beauty of the, of the ceiling. This is the ceiling plan. But uh, you know, the structure became ornamented as it should. Structure and ornament should come together and they do come together in this early work by uh, Louis Kahn. From the outside, uh, this is how the building looked like, but still, uh, you know, distinctly modern. So this was from 1953. Now the city tower project in Philadelphia, which was unbuilt from 1952, a very important, in my opinion, work. It was not published, uh, it was not built, but uh, in this case, it seems Anting, uh, his lover at the time uh, was, uh, and her, his employee uh, had a, an important role. Maybe here it could have been Anting and Louis Kahn, maybe. Here they are, uh, Louis Kahn and Yan Ting, and I don't know who this person is. Um, anyway, here she is in older age, and this is the tower. Not a typical work for Louis Kahn. Uh, we can only regret it was not built, but, but the, the, the way the, the tower was uh, conceived, um, belongs rather to the, the, the architectural interests of Anting and not so much to Louis Kahn. Here she is, uh, you know, during a lecture, uh, imagine, um, a very special architect herself. Uh, here they are again, uh, Kahn on the left and in the middle and uh, Anting. Uh, so, you know, here they are, uh, while he was still married to Esther, anyway. Uh, but the tower is, is, is beautiful and uh, it has rigor, it has geometry, it also has freedom, it has expression, it's structurally sound, too bad it was not built. Uh, here uh, they are, I think, with a, I don't know who the other person is. Um, maybe it's that uh, structural engineer that he worked with a famous structural engineer also from Estonia. Uh, we are going to talk about him when we arrive at the Richards Laboratories and also the fourth world's uh, uh, museum, uh, Kimball Museum. <laughs> anyway, uh, but a great work done by Anting and uh, Louis Kahn. Unbuilt, but still a great work. Here, I think they also worked together at the Trenton. Yes, they did work together at this important work in the evolution of Louis Kahn, maybe also in the evolution of Anting as well. The Trenton Bath House um, in New Jersey, 1954, 1959, uh, a work of, of great simplicity but uh, a fundamental work for, for the beginning uh, of, uh, of uh, the mature uh, Louis Kahn. The, he already spent that uh, fruitful uh, year in Rome and uh, something, something happened then. Kahn, as opposed to the postmoderns, assimilated, digested history in a very profound way, in a deep way, and, and he used it creatively, not mimickingly. Uh, a great difference between Louis Kahn and the postmoderns. So this uh, Jewish bus, uh, uh, public bath in Trenton uh, was, is considered one of his uh, seminal works. Uh, in, in, in his evolution. And he did work with Anting here. 
in the in the in the movie my architect uh, done made by uh, his son um, uh, there is uh, an, an interview with Dan King and I think they even visit this um, Trenton bus bathhouse I mean Dan King and uh, you know the filmmaker uh, Louis Kahn's son the plan is very simple uh, you know but uh, it's not a simplistic building it has a quiet monumentality although its its scale is really it's a small uh, building just four pavilions connected at the corners with a courtyard that's it but this work shows up that it's possible to do important architecture with uh, you know uh, just a few materials and with uh, without a large budget or anything it's still a major work of architecture. Uh, this is a digital, uh, ah, this is a drawing by Louis Kahn. This is how it looks from the air. Um, these are several works by him. I mean, eight year, eight works by him. We are going to see all of them. As I said, this is a rather long presentation because I show more than 400, 450 pictures. So it's a comprehensive uh, review of, of his, uh, of his uh, oeuvre. Uh, that's how uh, this um, uh, bathhouse looks like now. Now we arrive at this work, which indeed is very important, when which I had the, 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 the chance to see. I, 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 so I was in front of it, uh, Richard's Laboratories in Philadelphia. This was the remarkable engineer that worked with Louis Kahn, Auguste uh, uh, Commandant. Uh, I think he was also born in, uh, in uh, Estonia or in Lithuania, but I think he also came, yes, from uh, Estonia. Anyway, either Estonia or Lithuania, they both came from the same region of the world. Uh, let's hope uh, the, the highly generous Russian army don't attack these two uh, nations. Uh, anyway, uh, the engineer was himself a, a remarkable engineer, very, very creative. So here is Khan, um, well, the cover of one of the books on him. This was the, the engineer. He also worked with Moshe Safdi in Montreal. He was the structural engineer for the work done by Safdi for the, you know, Montreal 67, uh, the famous uh, habitat. So Auguste Commandant, uh, yes, he was an Estonian American structural engineer, uh, five years uh, younger than uh, Louis Kahn those collaboration with famous architects and designers and engineers resulted in uh, several 20th century architectural masterpieces. His professional career spanned more than half a century from the 1930s to 1980s and coincided with an era characterized by modernization, urbanization, and the rapid development of technology. And this is the Richards Laboratories, uh, very fine work, by, uh, by Louis Kahn and uh, Commandant. Uh, the problem uh, here was uh, that, I mean problem, uh, functional problem. Uh, the scientists who worked in these laboratories, they had to defend themselves behind uh, large um, pieces of glass. When I was there, they covered it with um, aluminum foil to reflect uh, to, yes, the, the natural light to not allow it to get into the, uh, into the labs. Maybe you know, in this work, Louis Kahn explored the idea of serving spaces, the towers, which contain the technical uh, spaces and you know, the services, and then the served spaces. So he used two, the, the dialectics of two kinds of spaces. The serving ones, in this case, the opaque ones, the towers inspired by San Gimignano in Italy, uh, the medieval towers in San Gimignano and the, the labs, the served spaces where the scientists worked and so on. It's a very fine building. 
and look at the structure equally sophisticated and simple at the same time, complex, the entrance through the corner diagonally, uh, the corner free from a structural element. Again, this is about two creative people, highly creative. We can only be inspired by their ex example. And uh, you see the, the honesty of the structure but also the, 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 the emotional or the expressive um, potential of the structure to participate in the, in the making of architecture. So um, it's possible that this building was the launching pad for, uh, for um, or launching board for uh, Louis Kahn International. It was very publicized, it was very appreciated, and uh, I would say with good reasons. Uh, anyway, studies, you see the towers in San Gimignano in Italy, apparently he inspired himself from them, but he didn't mimic them, you know, in, a, in an unconvincing way. His building has uh, the power of a genuine creation, but he was apparently inspired by San Gimignano, by these towers, which are impressive indeed. Here is his building, here is San Gimignano. Here it is his building, here it is San Gimignano. Anyway. You see, a uh, good work, an honest work, a work, but when I say honest, things are not so simple. You know, there is honesty, of course, nothing is hidden. You can see, uh, Jean Ouvel said uh, rather recently that uh, in the past, during Kant's time as well, it was a requirement almost that structure was uh, exposed uh, honestly, sincerely. And that in his time, Jean Nouvel's time and our time as well, things are not like this any longer that actually, you know, the structure is to be hidden and so on. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe not. It's a matter to be discussed. So now we look at a house from 1957 in New Jersey. This was a house that was, believe it or not, uh, it was built by Louis Kahn, but uh, it was in uh, abandoned. Uh, it has something of the of the beauty of the of the ceiling and the roofing in the in the Trenton uh, bathhouse. We are going to see a picture. It was built about the, around the same time. Uh, yes, it was abandoned, but I think it was saved. Uh, and uh, so it was not destroyed and probably refurbished. Yes, you can see the, the ceiling and the roofing system that is, uh, you know, uh, interesting, uh, it's sculptural and it functions well as uh, for, for, for what is supposed to, uh, was supposed to be built. Now the Arts United Center in Fort Wayne, Indiana. This is a work uh, with some problems. In 1961, the architect Louis Kahn was commissioned to design and develop a large arts complex in Fort Wayne, Indiana. The ambitious fine arts center now known as the Arts United Center would cater for the community of 180,000 people by providing space for an orchestra, theater, a school, gallery, and much more. As a Lincoln Center in miniature, Lincoln Center, of course, is in New York City, the developers had hoped to update and upgrade the city through new civic architecture. However, due to budget constraints, only a fraction of the overall scheme was completed. It is one of Kahn's lesser known projects that spent over a decade and his only building in the Midwest. And he was not happy with it, and we can see why. Kant's original proposal encompassed, encompassed a philharmonic hall, art school gallery, and civic theater. 
Yet troubles began early in the project as the architect's $20 million estimate dwarfed the expected $2.5 million cost of the fine art center. So um, uh, in 1961, from 1961 to 1964, while also completing the Richards Medical Center, the one we just saw, for the University of Pennsylvania, Khan and his office worked a series of schemes for the expansive project. A collection of plaster models held by Museum of Modern Art revealed Khan's intention to arrive at a single entrance for all activities accessed either by foot or car. I think when all these activities come together, there is a kind of thing that is created, Khan said. They surely function in themselves, but when they come together, there is something new. This interest in the uh, re uh, re relationally, or uh, English is not so good here, of building and program uh, relationship anyway, like a majority of the project bow to economics, the mundane realities of parking, meant Kant's intention for an elevating parking tower as part of the complex with vanish in later study. Anyway, this is the building. This, this facade is probably one of the very few things to be admired. Why? Because it is a theater, this part of the building, and this is like a mask. And, and the mask, of course, plays a role in theater. But uh, the building is rather weak inside. You can tell this is not a building that made Louis Kahn happy. Yes, at the, the entrance lobby and the main facade is Louis Kahn, but um, I read that, uh, you know, like for example, here there are things that don't seem to actually belong to Louis Kahn. I, of course, he was very fond of the arch, but not like this. Uh, and uh, it, it was a failed, uh, failed project. Who knows, maybe some other architects uh, stepped in. Uh, it, it's a project that uh, didn't come to fruition as he intended. But there are still elements uh, of, of what he proposed, like that concrete wall and so on. But it's, it's just a fragment of a much larger project that he intended to build and it was not built, unfortunately. Anyway, we are going to see many other buildings that were built. So here it says, instead it remains a lasting testament to the negotiations and offer often frustrating realities of making architecture. He was not happy with this, uh, with, this, with, this with this building and we are not happy either because uh, he doesn't look very convincing, it's true. Anyway, the Yale Center for British Art, which I mentioned, also part of the of the Yale uh, University campus. It's a new uh, work that he built and is, uh, is, uh, is splendid, if I can say so. This combination between concrete and wood is, uh, is marvelous. The massivity of, of this concrete tower and then the, you know, the artworks displayed uh, on, on the wooden uh, panels, um, you know, uh, create both intimacy and a sense of, uh, I mean, it is a public space, but, but there is also a certain sense of intimacy, although the, the room is large. Um, it's an excellent work. And again, uh, we, is this combination uh, that, for example, Tadawando doesn't uh, experience uh, or doesn't explore wood and concrete which creates, I think, from there coming together um, uh, something more balanced and uh, I think uh, valid. <clears throat> because concrete by itself is a rather cold material. And when you bring wood in uh, with a mastery that uh, Louis Kahn uh, arrived at, uh, you are able to, to bring the opposites together, cold and warm. Uh, they come together. This is the plan, uh, very rigorous, very simple, but not simplistic. So this is the Yale Art Center at the, uh, the Yale University. 
by Louis Kahn. Again, the light, light is very important for Louis Kahn and in this uh, museum as well. It almost doesn't matter if the, art, the, if the artworks displayed are masterpieces or not. It doesn't matter, actually. The, still, the experience of the museum is a positive one. So, you know, because the building is, is, is creating that atmosphere that is uh, nourishing. And uh, you look at the light. Now, the first Unitarian Church in Rochester, New York, uh, it was built, uh, and uh, it's, an, it's an interesting church, it's an interesting building, and I will try to explain why. This is the plan. What is interesting about this, uh, this uh, church is that you see here the cross, as you know, in most cases, the cross on the ceiling would be of light. But here is the opposite. The light is at the corners, and the cross is uh, opaque and dark and even heavy. I don't know about this Persian rug here. I don't think it's the, you know, the contribution or the proposal of Louis Kahn. But this also happened at the Bryn Mawr uh, dormitory. Maybe the, the you know, the, the certain materials and even the grayness of certain materials like concrete. Um, you know, invited uh, the need for a uh, Persian rug, I guess. So this is in Rochester, it's a church. You see, many times good architects don't hide the constructive materials behind plaster or I don't know what. Here also, you see how the building was built. And uh, Louis Kahn even had words about this, that uh, it's important to see how a building came into being, how it was built. Now, Olivetti Underwood factory in Harrisburg, he built for Olivetti a factory. You know, uh, those who think that you cannot make architecture from a, such a banal, uh, uh, program a uh, factory is not true. Look here uh, with, with a lot of us uh, with structural integrity. It's an interesting building. Uh, and this is what you get when you hire a good architect. He can, uh, he can create uh, architecture with, uh, you know, uh, even a, an unusual architecture uh, from a program which doesn't promise a lot. So if Olivetti was innovative in its own activities, uh, so was Louis Kahn in, in his architecture. Structure again plays a, a role which goes beyond the, 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 the utilitarian aspect of what a structure is. It becomes ornamental almost, becomes, becomes uh, aesthetically charged. I don't know who the engineer was for this building, but here is the, you know, the, the plan. Interesting, this, um, you know, this, uh, I don't know how to call it. Is it an addition? I don't know what function it has, but this shows again that how undogmatic Louis Kahn was. Most architects, if they would have used such a, you know, composition, architectural composition, I don't think they would have dared to have this uh, rebellious uh, uh, part there. But uh, he was not a banal architect, so he welcomed uh, the accident of exception. And uh, the beauty of the structure is, uh, is for all to see, even in terms of uh, the drawing itself the working drawing. 
I would gladly put such a drawing on the wall, frame and admire it. So it was completed in 1970. Louis Kahn died in 1973. So, um, you know, uh, the same engineer, Auguste uh, Commandant, it's important to mention the, the, the engineer, because again, in this case, the, the structure becomes architectural, thanks to the architect, but also thanks to the engineer. Now, Exeter Library, one of his best works, in my opinion, and not only my opinion, there are some critics who say, wait, this building, you don't know exactly where the, uh, the entrance is. It's true. It's true, you don't. But maybe he did this intentionally, you know, because what is the entrance, the triumphal entrance into a library, meaning into knowledge? Uh, those who delude themselves that it's an easy road towards uh, knowledge, and they might be wrong. Uh, a very fine building. And uh, I, if I was uh, more uh, forceful today, and if I had more time, I would have probably uh, took the occasion to attack the Seattle Library by uh, Rem Kolhas in comparison with this building by, um, by Louis Kahn. The, um, the most impressive archi part, architecturally speaking, is the core, which is the void. But then, no, but the, maybe I didn't uh, express myself correctly. It's, uh, it's this uh, vortex that he created with the individual uh, places for study at the periphery. Uh, it's a very fine work. And, uh, you know, it's really a, a metaphor for, uh, you know, the, the, the unknown, the, the, the um, Yes, the, the exploration of the unknown, which questing for knowledge is. I remember what Sayark has at its motto, I'm referring to the famous architecture school in Los Angeles. To hell with regulations, we are going for the unknown. Well, here, this library, the Exeter Library by Louis Kahn is also going for the unknown. And the X here is representing just that, the unknown. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a famous library. It's not very large, but it has uh, an inner force, an inner monumentality. And again, he combines wood with concrete quite convincingly. Everything relates to everything else. The parts express the whole and the whole express the parts. Uh, and the massive walls, here with the individual uh, places for individual study protect the core of the building, which is the sensitive uh, substance of the library. An excellent building, an excellent building. And it doesn't matter what you look at, sections, plans, photographs, uh, you name it. It has a, a, an incredible coherence and a, a coherence which is not boring because it's full of surprises. And it doesn't matter how many times you look at the building, you still enjoy it because it has inner force. Now here is another building on the same campus, the dining um, room if I am to call it a room for the students at Exeter, Exeter is an excellent uh, uh, institute of higher learning or university. And so these two buildings were built by Louis Kahn, the Exeter library during the construction. And uh, yes, apparently he built first uh, uh, the dining, uh, the dining uh, building, which is a good building and we are going to see it as well. I like this, uh, you know, this uh, this uh, individual uh, 
desks, uh, you know, with the natural light coming conveniently, and they saw something almost monastic here. It's this seriousness that Louis Kahn had in his buildings, you know, and I'm sorry, but I don't see the same seriousness in the Seattle Library by uh, Rem Kolhas, which I could comment on uh, negatively in, in some respects. Now the dining hall at Exeter, which we just saw, so this was built before Exeter, uh, and uh, in, uh, it's it's an interesting uh, building itself. Uh, some I say it's too monumental for a dining room or dining building. Um, Yes, maybe. And plus, it's also a little bit uh, too um, monastic, too rigid. Um, but uh, it's clear that he was, uh, he returned from Rome, from Italy, uh, inspired in a deep way by what, we, what, he, what, he, what he saw there. This is a, an architecture which, which is modern, but it's, it has a uh, it's animated by a spirit which is, I think, transcends somehow modernity. Both the Exeter Library and the dining building are uh, imbued with a spirit which transcends, I think, the, the ephemerality of modernity. So here is, uh, I hope I have other pictures from the inside. He also uh, manipulated rotations, worked with rotations uh, all the time. That's because he wanted, uh, uh, he, he worked very rigorously with geometry, but he also wanted to create a dynamic geometry. So uh, it was important to, to rotate things, the square or whatever it was. Yeah, I don't have another picture, but uh, if you are interested, you can see on the web. Anyway, this is the dining building at Exeter, and we saw the library. Now we go to another famous building by him, the Salk Institute at La Jolla in California. This was commissioned by uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Jonas Salk, uh, who uh, discovered uh, the, uh, the vaccine against poliomyelite, if I pronounce correctly this. And uh, this is a research institute. Uh, from what I read, uh, Jonas Salk, the doctor, uh, the client, asked Louis Kahn just this. Make a building uh, worthy of being visited by, uh, by uh, Picasso. And uh, um, Louis Kahn tried and did, and I think he succeeded. As an anecdote, it seems that uh, Jonas Salk married the, the second or the third wife of Picasso. Now, I don't know if after Picasso visited, uh, and, I, and certainly after, after Picasso got divorced from that uh, uh, the second or third wife, whom uh, you know, Jonas Salk married. But back to architecture, it's truly uh, a remarkable um, architectural achievement, the, you know, all these, um, you know, uh, study rooms or research spaces open towards the Pacific Ocean. Uh, apparently, Luis Kahn consulted himself with Luis Barragan about what to do in this uh, space in between these two rows of buildings. Um, he initially wanted to we have vegetation here, and apparently uh, Luis Barragan told him, "No, don't, don't, don't uh, bring in any any green, any." So they decided, or he decided, not to, and he probably did the correct thing. Uh, you know, advised by uh, Luis Barragan, who knew something about green and about landscape, and himself a great architect. Um, I forgot either either the the, the the equinox or the solstice. I have to remember the the sun, and I don't know if in the morning or in the evening. Either the sunset or the sunrise. The sun is exactly here, in line with uh, this uh, narrow piece of water, and there are spectacular spectacular views uh, of that special moment. Either the equinox the solstice. 
I should have known, but uh, I forgot. Uh, anyway, I hope I have some images in, 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 in this respect. Again, wood, I think it is thick and concrete. Uh, and uh, again, as opposed to Tadao Ando, who only uses obsessionally concrete, Luis Kahn, in my opinion, was a more complex architect than, uh, than, than Tadao Ando. I'm not trying to diminish uh, Tadao Ando, but the, the, the very fact that Luis Kahn worked with both wood and concrete and was not afraid to bring them together uh, shows, I think, uh, uh, disposition towards a higher level of complexity. Uh, Monomaterial is problematic, in, in my opinion. Because a, a great work in general, symbolically, metaphorically, factually, unites the opposites, cold with warm, left with right, up with down, the male and the female. It, talking about the masculine principle and the feminine principle. This is the, the alchemy of, of creativity. And if you only work with the mono material, uh, you don't unite the opposites. Now, of course, in the case of Tadao Ando, he also employs light. So you could say he works with concrete and light, but so does Luis Kahn. He doesn't ignore light, but he also brings in, uh, you know, the, the warmth of the wood in conjunction with, uh, with, with concrete. These are the plans and the sections. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a place just like the Richards laboratories destined to science, but it transcends, uh, it becomes a humane, a humanistic place and even a spiritual place. This uh, narrow, thin, uh, a uh, line of water that uh, brings water to the Pacific Ocean. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's magical, it's, it's spiritual. It's, it's, it's about spirit, it's a spiritual uh, uh, quest, which science at its best should have as well. Um, uh, this, this drawing perhaps is not very easily uh, readable, but uh, you understand, these are the, the rooms uh, that open, they have glass here and you can see the Pacific Ocean from each room. And these are the, 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 the rooms uh, of, of, of study, of research, because that's what the, the, the Salk Institute is. So you see, you have the scientist with his or her own room, but, but they all celebrate the ocean, the sky, the light. So there is something beyond science. And what is beyond science is the, you know, the, the cosmic power of, 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 of everything, light, heaven, sky, the sunlight, uh, the ocean. Thus the scientists become poets in a way. And uh, look, it doesn't matter at what time of the day you take pictures of this uh, remarkable building, is still telling you the, 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 the same story, that you have men and then you have the gods or God, and they are in some kind of a dialogue in, in, in this building and in, 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 the, in the best buildings, uh, you know, in the history of architecture. Water also, you know, comes channeled by men, comes towards the Pacific Ocean. Now the Bryn Mawr dormitory, uh, we saw sketches of it is a, another excellent building by him with a very strict geometry. Some people think that uh, it is a little bit problematic uh, the interior because it's, uh, it's rather cold, um, you know, almost monastic. Uh, yes, concrete is as it is, but fortunately here we have some uh, Persian rugs um, that, um, you know, bring with them uh, maybe a necessary warmth. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting building using a black stone and concrete, the structure, and here is a view from the air, uh, you know, three squares rotated and connected at the corners. It seems that for Louis Kahn, the, the, the corner is, uh, is paramount, is important, and then he uh, gives access through the corner. 
and then, then the connection happens. Uh, in his case, it's also we can talk about the adoration of the joy, like like he talked about uh, when he uh, reflected on the work of his friends Carlos Carpa. You know, these uh, these plants uh, they 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 connect uh, through the fragility of the corner, and. Um, you know, it, 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 there is multiplicity and there is unity. Maybe there is an austerity here, which is not very common for, a, you know, a, like in this case, a dining a dining room. But uh, it depends. It depends what it depends what your values are. It's certainly not an architecture of, uh, uh, you know, of Mickey Mouse. It's a different kind of architecture, but but uh, concrete is still cold. It's true. Now the Kimball Museum, where he worked together with the same remarkable engineer, uh, August uh, Commandant, uh, beautiful building. Uh, Renzo Piano built next to it another building. Uh, you know, you would ask why did he leave this uh, open here? Because he wanted to show. The, the, you know, in a way, the, uh, in a way, uh, it's similar to Brinkush leaving the last uh, um, uh, prism uh, at the top of the, the endless column uh, cut in half. It's to show uh, it's an open ended, it, it, it's, 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 it's still, a, it's, a, it's a building that is still, I mean, it's, it's, it's crystallized, but it's not. Uh, frozen in immobility. This part shows that it could continue. Metaphorically, it represents, you know, the, the open end uh, and thus not an end of art, of culture. Light is distributed beautifully. Uh, he was a very deep and sophisticated architect. That's the truth. And that's because he, 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 he he never neglected the spiritual uh, core of architecture. And this is something that very few architects do today. You see how the light is channeled on the curvature of the roof. So it reaches properly the artworks displayed on the, on the on the walls. Even the working drawings are nice, in my opinion. I mean, nice, yes, aesthetically nice, uh, not just technically, but I, I like these drawings very much. I wish I had such a drawing. By the way, of this, I read when, when Louis Kahn died, his wife had to sell uh, the furniture in his office and his drawings because he was in debt. The most important architect in the world, probably at that time, was in debt. Not only that he didn't become rich, but he was in debt and you would ask why. Well, apparently because he was paying his employees to study and study and study and you know the money he received for the projects were limited. Now here we see his face, but uh, I regret that Anting is not uh, shown, although it's possible that he was at least as much the author of this uh, tower that we already looked at as Louis Kahn was. Uh, this is another injustice that to women, you know, uh, it's shown only Louis Kahn, but the truth is this belong, it's possible more to Anting than to Louis Kahn. Here is a diagram of you know how he studied very very carefully how light is brought correctly uh, you know washing the walls and uh, arriving at the artworks properly. A great museum it is. I'm sure uh, Pil Mondrian would be happy uh, with my statement. And this is the work by Renzo Piano. So here is Luis Kahn, and here is Renzo Piano. Now, Dhaka, Bangladesh. How do you explain that one of the poorest countries in the world commissioned Luis Kahn what 
what, what the United States did, you know. And uh, now they have uh, in Dhaka, uh, you know, important, very important buildings by Louis Kahn. That's because of the inspiration, the, you know, the deciding factors in the administration of Bangladesh of Dhaka had. Let's start first by looking at the hospital. If, if you believe this is a hospital, but it is, why should a hospital look like a hospital? Why shouldn't the, the hospital look like, like it is not a hospital? Yes, it's, it's, it, it was built, uh, uh, you know, not with a lot of technology, maybe not with a lot of money. It's very possible Louis Kahn was not even paid for some of the works he did. Uh, I think he, uh, I was told uh, that uh, in, uh, in, uh, in India, in Ahmedabad, he was not paid. Uh, um, it's possible even here, maybe he was not paid or he was paid very little. He was not into making money. He was into making architecture. This must be said over and over again especially to those who think that architecture is a means to, to get rich. No, architecture is an art and is a spiritual art and you should treat it accordingly. Now, if some money comes in, okay, but don't use architecture to, to, to fill your pockets. That's not, a, that's not what architecture is made for. And this building, yes, it's, it's both impressive, monumental, but also modest. Uh, somehow, and it's a most unusual hospital, without doubt. This is what you get when you hire a very creative architect like Louis Kahn. You can see the level of the country of Dhaka at that time was, uh, well, now it, it has uh, good architects. Uh, Bangladesh has excellent architects, actually. But at the time when it was built, the country was struggling financially. But even if it was struggling financially, it had the spirit, the openness, the inspiration, the intuition to hire the correct architect. Bravo to them. France didn't hire Le Corbusier as India did for Chandigarh, and the United States didn't hire Louis Kahn the way Bangladesh hired him. Now, government buildings also in Dhaka. Uh, again, if you can believe it, that these are maybe, you know, uh, buildings for the minister, ministries. And, but it's, it's again, you know, th these buildings make, make all of us uh, poets and visionaries because, I mean, look at this huge opening here, contemplating the water, you know. It, I think even a less sensitive person becomes more sensitive by necessity. And look at these buildings, very unusual, very archetypal, very powerful, uh, you know, austere, but also warm because it is brick and water. What do we have here? We have the sky above, the water below, and the brick in between. Um, How many governmental buildings in the world look like this? Not many, not many at all. Now, of course, the pedantic one would claim, what is this? Look how dirty it is, look how unacceptably dirty it is. No, no, this is not dirt, this is brick. And uh, okay, if the pedantic one uh, protests, we can only laugh and turn our back on the pedantic one. No, these are, powerful buildings by a powerful architect for a powerful country. It didn't matter, it didn't have money. It was still powerful. Look at this, you know, I mean, uh, should we compare this architecture with what we have here, you know, uh, so-called the parliament building? No, we can't, we can't. And I like the fact that it is not these buildings don't use makeup. They don't, they don't need to use makeup. It's like a beautiful person who is beautiful from the inside out. The soul is beautiful. And, and, and then you don't need makeup. These buildings don't need makeup. They are fine as they are. And then this is the, the assembly hall, the large building uh, 
that uh, during the the war with uh, with Pakistan, when the bombers of Pakistan were flying above this building, they didn't bomb it because they thought it was already bombed because it didn't have the roofing here. Luis Khan needed two years to arrive at the correct uh, solution, and he did arrive at the correct solution. But at the time of the war between Pakistan and Bangladesh, it was not yet done. And because of it, uh, I read the, 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 the planes, the, the pilots of those bombers thought that it was already bombed, so it was not necessary to throw another bomb there. Now, the assembly hall building, which is this one, the, the, the most important building on this, uh, uh, you know, on this site, uh, and the interior again, you know, this is music, this is architectural music. You know, imagine the people who, it's hard for me to believe that, that, that architecture does not contribute at least in part to the betterment of, uh, of human consciousness, actually. You know, it's, it's a surprising building, you know. And again, one of the poorest countries in the world has one of, of the most forward looking architectures in the world because you don't need to be rich in order to have vision. Uh, the people of Bangladesh understood the spirit of the works of Louis Kahn, and that's why they commissioned him for such a courageous uh, um, you know, work. Uh, when he died, in fact, he died when he returned from Bangladesh, he died at Penn Station in New York, the building continued, the, it was not finalized when he died. So certain things were done after his death and maybe not as uh, gracefully as he would have wished, he would have wished. Here is um, um, uh, the, 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 the mosque, a beautiful mosque. And I hope I have here images of the interior. This is a, a remarkable building. It's a fortress, it's a citadel. Yes, it's a citadel, but it's a citadel for political uh, reasons, but also I would feel also for spiritual reasons. It's a citadel for spirit, a fortress for spirit. It defends different values. This is the system of the roofing covering the large space, the assembly hall that he was searching for uh, the solution. And the, here you see the, the picture of what he arrived at and what he built. And uh, in the story the, that I, I mentioned, uh, it, it, it was not there um, at that time. Anyway, it's, it's, it's as it should be. You know, he, he struggled for two years, but he achieved it. This is a courageous architecture. It's a heroic architecture. Uh, some people accuse it of formalism. Yes, maybe there are certain aesthetical decisions having to do with, you know, a certain level of what might be called formalism. But uh, someone uh, said recently, in fact, uh, she published a book called Form Follows Feeling. So uh, this is something we forget most of the time. We forget feeling. We say form follows function. We say all kinds of things but we don't think of feeling. Uh, this is the interior of the mosque uh, and it's, it's splendid. You know, it's, I hope I have other pictures. You know, it's a mosque, but it's abstracted. In fact, it belongs to spirit in general beyond frontiers between uh, various uh, denominations. They are very rich, the people in Dhaka and in, uh, in, uh, in Bangladesh, for having such buildings. Whatever the cynics might say. Again, an image from the mosque, where the light plays an important role, but uh, it's not just the light. It's, 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 it's a very inspiring place, and it would be inspiring to anyone, not just uh, Muslims.
Now, the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, India, I said this before, uh, Doshi, the Indian architect, the first Indian architect who received the Pritzker Prize in architecture. He worked a little bit with Louis Kahn. He also worked before with Le Corbusier. And he said Le Corbusier was my guru and Louis Kahn was my yogi, uh, my yogi. And, uh, you know, with such a guru and such a yogi, you could only become a good architect yourself. And he became without studying formally architecture at all. And he got the Pritzker Prize. Bravo to Doshi. He brought actually Khan to Ahmedabad. So this is the plan of the Institute of Management in Ahmedabad by, uh, by Louis Khan. Louis is adored Khan. I mean, you know, this, this architecture is atemporal, is ahistorical, is archetypal. Now, I will end this presentation on Louis Kahn with his private houses. He built several private houses and he showed that he could do very large, um, you know, governmental buildings, but he could also uh, bring his skill to smaller buildings, private houses. The Fisher House in Pennsylvania, uh, again, he works in here, he brings the wood outdoors, outside, uh, the outside of the building. And, um, you know, he has, a, he also employs uh, uh, stone here. And, uh, you know, the patina of the wood, you know, uh, having a dialogue with the elements, with the rain, with the snow, with the sunlight, only uh, amplifies, in my opinion, the nobility of the building. There is a strong geometry. There is the rotation that we noticed in, uh, in some of his buildings. You see, a house is like a box, but this being a wooden box and manipulated uh, properly in terms of the openings, the windows, the, the, the doorways and so on, it's, it's not an arrogant box. Somehow, yes, it says I'm the work of man and nature is the work of God, but in the duality between uh, the house and nature or the trees, in this case, we do not see, uh, uh, yes, they are distinct, but it's not war. They, they almost, they complement each other. And I love this corner here where the, you know, the frame of the window becomes furniture. You know, it's sculptural, it's, uh, it's very interesting. You know, it's, it's different from most, architectures which at the corner let's say uh, obtain freedom by having a um, you know uh, a corner window just glass but here is different you know again the 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 the, the framing of the window becomes also uh, the sculptural parts of, 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 of furniture and uh, this this uh, this creates something that is worth uh, in my opinion uh, uh, not imitating, but reflecting on and, uh, and so on. 
you know, he 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 arrived at the, the, the desired or desirable feeling of freedom in different ways from, uh, let's say, Frank Lloyd Wright or Le Corbusier because of this. And again, it shows it shows a different spirit. Louis Kahn was a complex uh, man who was not uh, uh, finding refuge behind simplistic geometries. He was welcoming hybridity as well. Maybe, you know, there is a similarity between uh, uh, hybridity and suffering. Maybe we can talk about the suffering of the building. Suffering which is expressed architectonically through some kind of a, an impurity or lack of purity, but, but that lack of purity is actually rich in meaning. Now the Escherich house, uh, but, you know, it's the plan. It's it's very simple, but when you look at the building, it's not uh, it's not simplistic at all. You can see that uh, Mario Botta, for example, found some inspiration in Louis Kahn. Unfortunately, Mario Botta sometimes became a, a little bit manneristic. This was not the case with Kahn. Uh, Miss van der Rohe, uh, Rohe, Rohe was right. Uh, you know, you have to start from life and from within, from the interior towards the exterior. And now these are words. How exactly you do it, uh, it depends on the skill of the architect and the intensity of his involvement or his or her involvement with the, with the project at hand. But this building still looks, and it was built, uh, you know, more than 50 years ago or so, it still looks kind of timeless and uh, almost uh, uh, surprisingly modern. You know, uh, this is the power of art to transcend time and transgress time and transgress even death. Another good building by, by Louis Kahn. The Shapiro residence. This is a building where I don't have to, I think I have only two pictures. I couldn't find other pictures, but, but this one is engaging and interesting too. I so regret uh, I have only two pictures and not very, uh, not very satisfying, but I couldn't find others. We see the return of the, well, if we are to call it a return of that ceiling roofing that we saw in the Trenton library, in the Trenton bus, bus house, and in that first house that uh, we saw abandoned. And again, I like very much the, the, the bringing of the wood towards the outside and uh, the allowance for the wood to confront the elements uh, without the need for, um, you know, uh, decorative, uh, uh, you know, uh, without the need for the para paraphernalia of protection to use the words of Rem Kolhas. And a sketch, a little sketch, little because I couldn't find a better resolution for this very house. Uh, now I see I have a few more pictures. This is from the other side. Um, no, is I thought it was the last work I show, but no, I, this is a, a, a work that was realized uh, after um, after he died. The Four Freedoms Park in uh, in, uh, in New York City, uh, and um, let's see, Bill. Four decades after Louis Kahn's death, New York City's Four Freedoms Park. The architect posthumous. Uh, memorial to Frank, Franklin D. Roosevelt and his policies is becoming one of the architect's most popular urban spaces. In a recent article for The Guardian, Oliver Wainwright investigates what he describes as perhaps Kahn's best build, best project. Wainwright's spatial description of the monument is interweaved by fragments of Kahn's personal history, building up a picture of a space with a feel of an ancient temple pressing and a finely nuanced landscape. Although Gina Polara, who ultimately realized the plans in 2005, 
argues that for Frieden's past tense is a memorial not only to uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt and the New Deal, but to Kahn himself. Can a posthumous project ever be considered as an architect's best? This was written by this person, James Taylor Foster. And here it is. Um, this is a drawing by Kahn. Again, this was built a few, some years, well, 20, 30 years after he died. I don't know. In my opinion, uh, it's, it's a little bit too clean and too, I, I know they try to they respect his project, but I'm not sure that everything was truly as he would have wished. I could be wrong, but I don't, I don't, I don't see Louis Kahn at his best here, whatever these people might say. These new shots by photographer Ty Cole document the scene of Louis Kahn's Four Freedmen's Freedom's Park in New York, which opened to the public in autumn 2012. So 40 years, uh, almost 40 years after it was de designed. That's, uh, you know, the head of uh, Roosevelt, but I don't know if Louis Kahn proposed it like this. Anyway, I, I, I have a rather uncomfortable feeling here that this is not what we saw in Ahmedabad and Dhaka and previously was Louis Kahn. Here is, yes, it was his project, but I think it was, uh, it was something seems to be missing in my opinion. Uh, it's, it's, it's too clean and too, in a way too, it's domesticated, it's tamed, but not everywhere. Like here we see some, some of the magic that Louis Kahn would have been able and was able to convey through his architecture. He is of course the, uh, the United Nations uh, building where people now meet uh, uh, frequently in order to ask what should we do with Putin? What should we do the, with the unacceptable uh, invasion of Ukraine? And here, far away, we see um, uh, the Empire State Building. So this was built 40 years after Louis Kahn died. And now I show a few unbuilt works. There is a, such a book which I actually had, I don't know if I still have, unbuilt Khan. People built so-called built virtually, digitally, the, uh, the unbuilt works by Louis, by, by, uh, by Louis Khan. Palazzo dei Congressi in Venice, not realized, but we still have the drawings, the model and so on. An ero another heroic uh, project proposed by uh, Louis Kahn for Venice. Maybe a little bit too heroic, I don't know. Venice is more fragile, but who knows? Now the Hurva Synagogue in Jerusalem would have been a remarkable project, but it remained a project. So a synagogue in Jerusalem Another fortress for the spirit, or a, a citadel, a citadel for spirit. These are digital renderings done after he died of the project. A drawing by him. The plan. It would have been nice if it was built, but it was not. But the thing, but, but for the history of architecture, for the spirit of architecture uh, is still important. And the memorial to the 6 million Jewish martyrs in New York, uh, another work which was not built I love the I love the, the the handmade drawings of Louis Kahn.
I think we are approaching the, the end of this presentation. Yes. So let's wish him happy birthday, although he was born on February 20th, but in the old system of counting time, that corresponds to the 5th of March. Then that's why we talked about him today. Happy birthday, Luis Kant. And thank you. <laughs>